made. I am not confident any longer that it is possible to actually predict, even with lots and lots of activity, genuine reform. And the reason for that is, when I said that capitalism has lost its spirit, and there's a highly concentrated, there's a high concentration not only of wealth, and not only a concentration of capital itself, but a high concentration of power. What I mean to say is that the struggle for reform has to be transformative, not little reform, such that the system begins to shake. And I'm going to give you one very small example. Suppose, for the sake of illustration, we had a movement that fought for the six-hour day. We would create more jobs than all the government programs combined. People are fighting to get, work, to get hours in the fast food industry. They get six hours, but they can't actually get health insurance. But if we fought for the six-hour day and fought for it in the factories, fought for it in the service institutions, fought for it on the street, we would have a different kind of situation. I'm not using this as only one example. The problem is that's not a little reform. People did, in fact, die in the fight for the eight-hour day. They died. Albert Parsons died. And people died to organize unions when the unions were coming up from the bottom. So that if we actually had a serious attempt to organize Walmart, you would see how difficult that would be in terms of force and violence. That would be another small reform. Only, only, only a million workers in Walmart don't have the, the way to live. $8.88 an hour. But it's not going to happen from within the official trade union movement. It's going to have to happen from the outside. Where from the outside? I want to say one more thing and I'm, I'm going to stop. We've had movements. You're absolutely right. And there's an argument that I make in my latest, this book on labor, which I just finished, <coughs> that we should not take power in the, over the unions. I, I don't believe in that. Because I don't think it's going to work. If we take power of the unions, we're going to have to break the law. That's a different kind of power. But our problem at this point is that we have to be realistic about what happened to the what happened to the landless peasant movement in Brazil when a workers' party coming out of the official trade union movement broke the landless movement. We have to look at what's happening in Bolivia, where the Bolivian government, which everybody thought was hot shit, is now developing fossil fuels to be able to survive as a country because you can't have a, a socialism in one country. I learned that from being a boy Stalinist. <laughs> you can't have, you, we don't even have a Latin American economic union. So we have to be very careful about our characterizations. I think we're at an interesting point when Cornell says there's a lot of awareness, I think that awareness is there. But what can happen with the awareness? It can go in three directions. People have tremendous awareness and they go to the right because the right has a spiritual message. And it's not necessarily a religious message, it's a message of redemption. We don't even know the word redemption on the left. Although there were some leftists who did know it, Benjamin, for example, right? Um, the second place that they, people can go is that they can go into despair and they can retire from politics even though they have a tremendous amount of understanding. Hegel talked about that in 1807 in the Phenomenology of the Spirit. He called it the unhappy consciousness. You have the unhappy consciousness because you don't think you can win, you don't think you can do anything and so on. The third possibility is that we develop a spirit not of reform but of revolutionary fervor. 
that people begin to say it is not acceptable for us to take $10.10 an hour and small reforms even if they're offered. Of course, that's not a reform even, by the way. That we, can, that we need to have fundamental change. And the only way we're going to get it is not by resistance alone, although I'm for resistance, not by protest, although I'm for protest, but we have to have a conception of what is the good life. And your point is correct. In order for everybody to have a good life, some of us are going to have to give something up. And when we learn to give something up, to, to have a good life for all, we really meant that we want to have equality. Not $10.10 an hour, but equality. Then that's going to mean a fundamental massive redistribution of wealth, even for the people like Cornell and me who make money. I'm serious. You make much more money than I do, but that's exactly what I But no, but you know, you know what I mean. But these are things that we have to talk about. We're unwilling to talk about about wealth and power. We're unwilling because we don't have the least idea what it means to have any kind of genuine power in a society which has deprived us of even our citizenship. You think the people of Katrina had citizenship? You think the people in Staten Island had citizenship? They didn't have democratic citizenship. They could have voted for the same old, same old, but there was no citizenship. They had no power over their own lives. And that's what participatory democracy really means. It means you make the decisions over your own lives. You do not depend on the state. You do not depend on powers from above. That's why in the 60s we had a movement. 